Welcome to Gross Anatomy. Hello and welcome to Gross Anatomy Podcast, where we explore the sights, smells, and sounds of medicine and how it pertains to pop culture, meaning books, movies, TV, and the world around us. And I am Lauren Taylor, joined with Dr. Jason Cohen. Okay, we'll just get right into it. I know you're super busy, Dr. Cohen. There are a few things in the news I did want to discuss. One was that, unfortunately, the tallest man has died at only 38 years old. His name was Igor. He came from the Ukraine to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 1989 as a child seeking treatment. So there was a tumor pressing against his pituitary gland that caused it to secrete abnormal levels of growth hormone. And then he grew to become the tallest man in the U.S. at seven feet eight point three three inches. So acromegaly is is the is what happens with someone with this growth hormone pituitary tumor, and um, yeah. So it wasn't a surprise when you told me that. I I knew you were going to be saying that. That's that's why you think like the world record holder would always have that problem. I don't know uh, that that. Not necessarily the case, no, not necessarily. But but just when you started talking about that, it didn't um, it it didn't surprise me. So, have you ever had to remove a tumor like that, or have you had any experience with people growing too fast because of that? So, I personally, you know, I really don't do brain stuff. You know, it's considered it's it's typically in the realm of brain surgeons, pituitary tumors, because oh. it's kind of at the base of the brain. So, it's not really something. I've dealt with the the nice thing about it is often it could be treated. Um, sometimes it could be treated with medicines, but otherwise, these days there are surgeries where they actually go like through here. They're able rather than have to, because it's deep in the bottom of the brain, so they're able to go. It's called transphenoidal. They're, they're able to go through the sinuses in and deal with that with scopes and things like that. I've never actually done those surgeries, but those are fancy, elegant surgeries that that um, can deal with those types of tumors. I was just looking at, you just got me interested in, uh, we're both big fans of The Princess Bride. So immediately I thought of- Yeah, Andre the Andre, Giant. Andre the Giant. He was only seven feet, how tall? Seven was he? Seven four, seven foot four mm-hmm. inches. So he was a pretty big guy, um, and he, he had a gi- what is it called? Gigantism is what he had uh-huh. had. Yeah, and and he was he also died young of heart issues as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Princess Bride, great movie. Yeah. So this guy was the tallest, and apparently he didn't even have shoes that fit him. So people donated so he could have shoes and then Reebok created his own shoes for him because he was like a size 26 and his feet would just wow anything he tried to wear. I know this poor guy. Size 26. Huh. Yeah. So, I mean, there's obviously a downside to being the Guinness World Book record for tallest man. Right. But was he the tallest man ever or the current tallest? Current. Man? So that's a good question. I don't know who the tallest man ever was. Right. I, I think. Or actually, this says he was the tallest man in the United States. So I need to double check if it's the world. And if I'm not, not mistaken, I, I think Andre the Giant also had, I, we'll have to double check, but I think Andre the Giant also had uh, pituitary, you know, the same the same issue. But but that'll have to be a homework assignment of ours to see if he yeah. had the same acromegaly. I did, from right, I did watch that documentary, which I didn't think was that great, but I forgot. I don't know if they mentioned it. I Andre the it. Giant documentary. You didn't see it. It was like a, I think it was a Bill Simmons doc. I didn't see it, but I need to. Yeah. And then the other question I had in the news, uh, did you hear about it in the Mississippi health officials were pleading for people not to take this um, horse and cow medicine and vertimestin or something. I V E R M E C T I N. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. It's apparently prescribed to people for, sometimes head lice or skin conditions, but in completely different doses than these animals are being given. And so in Mississippi, they are taking what the animals are being given because they think it's going to treat their COVID and they don't want to take the vaccine. You know, I I haven't heard of ivermectin being used now for COVID, but it, but it is a medicine, you know, it made initially, I, I don't know initially, but it's, but it is a medicine for, um, parasitic infections. Um, 
I believe if I'm yeah if I'm, so that's why I guess people are taking it but it's being in animals which like cows can weigh a thousand pounds so people right. are taking this and apparently 70 percent of like poison control calls now are be in Mississippi are because of that because people are taking this medicine how are the how are the people doing COVID wise yeah I don't think they're faring well and right it's weird that they don't want to listen to all these docs or doctors that tell them to take the vaccine but from what I can tell Joe Rogan on his podcast had someone that was promoting this drug and they're willing to just take their word for it. Yeah. I don't even think it's a political thing. You know, I wanted to talk about COVID a a little bit. The the whole last year we were in a different place of COVID. Now we're in a totally, we're still dealing with COVID, but I feel like it's, it's, it's been around for so long and everybody and their sister is a COVID expert at this point in time. And Mm -hmm. I want to say first and foremost, that I am not a COVID expert and I'm not an infectious disease expert. And I know a little bit of a lot of stuff, you know, that that's basically what I know. Um, but what surprised me is everybody's claiming that the whole COVID to vax or not to vax is, is political. I think it's, it's, it's not political anymore. I, I don't think so. I think it's, I'm, I'm seeing left-wing people not want the shot. I'm seeing right-wing people not want the shot. I, I think we've passed the political thing. And unfortunately, I still think it's a problem of trust. Mm-hmm. And and I talked about it, you know, on one of our silly TikToks. I don't think we, meaning doctors, but, and to some degree, I guess I'm to blame too, because I guess theoretically I should be doing a ton of research on it and be able to, to be more educated on it. But certainly doctors, certainly doctor leaders um, and scientists and politicians and the media, I think we're doing a horrible job of, of, of teaching, teaching. I I think we're doing too much preaching and not enough teaching. And I think that's a really, really big problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And I talk about with surgery, when we, before we do a surgery on a patient, we have to do informed consent. We have to go over and I do it. And I, and I tell the patients, I'm like, this probably isn't going to happen. And sometimes they'll ask, ask me statistics of all the things that could go wrong. And I really try to run the gamut of everything that could go wrong. And most of the time after I do that, the patients say, okay, but I know I probably should do the surgery. And, and that's because they have informed consent. And I don't think we're really doing that Mm-hmm. with the vaccine. I don't, you know, with the, with teaching about the vaccine, I think, unfortunately, we've kind of gotten to the point where the people who believe in it are just saying, yeah, the people who don't believe it are fools and they need to do it as opposed to, and the people who don't believe in it won't even listen to the people who do believe in it. And, and we're kind of at this weird place, you know, it's, it's way past the whole anti-vaxxer kind of thing, which mm-hmm. is, seems like a real minority. This this is a lot of people don't believe in it. And, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, I know we're doing a horrible job, not the country, the world is doing a horrible job in really coming together and informing us. Yeah. It seems like we're definitely failing. Um, but and then, not- and then since we're on the topic of COVID, You know, I talked about my favorite magazine. We did a, I did a little post about that. My favorite magazine is Vanity Fair. I love Vanity Fair. And they did an article, not in this current month, but the last one's Vanity Fair about the origin of the COVID virus. You know, where did it come from? And the, and they just, you know, and then Biden, when he got into office said, okay, three months, you got to tell me where did it come from? You know, and the different thinking is, did it either come from an animal vector? Did it jump from some kind of animal or did it come from a lab? And I, I don't know if you heard the reports. The reports are, they don't know. They don't have yeah. enough information. So, you know, that just came out. And that's basically what the article said, too, is, you know, we need to do more investigating. But it didn't rule out one way or the other. And that just feeds. And, and the fact that, at least in the beginning, so many people said, you know, so many of the experts said, there's no way it could have come from the lab. There's no, it just... These all these doubters now, now that these the study Vanity Fair and the and the commission of Biden, now that they said we don't know, it's hard to say, it just it just shows we're doing a bad job of trying to figure this yeah, thing. Not, not so much trying to figure this out, but try, but 
in terms of disclosures and letting conspiracy theories just run wild. I agree completely. Yeah. Um, I'd say I want to move on to something happier because we're going to talk about the Val Kilmer documentary that we watched. Um, but I was, it made me super sad, Dr. Cohen. I was a little bit, I wasn't mad at you, but I was a little bit like, I don't, I love Val Kilmer, but I didn't watch that on my own because I knew it would make me sad. And I, and, and then I have you to watched it. it and I was like, oh, now I have to watch well, it. Well, I need to confess something. It was getting late and we turned it off before the last 15 minutes because we, so I didn't see the last 15 minutes, but I, I doubt much more happened in those last 15 minutes. No, you just, no, it's just ended with sad music. And I was just, yeah, sad. but we, the last we saw of it was he was at those um, conventions signing autographs. Yeah. So he talks about that. And obviously I guess he needs the money and how he's like conflicted about doing that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, he has an appreciation to for his fans, obviously. Right. Yeah. I, it, it, it was really, I, I wish he had showed more of the, the great part of that documentary with a clips that with him and all the act, his actor colleague buddies, that was great stuff. So we should tell our audience that the documentary is just called Val and you can stream it on Amazon. And it's obviously more than just a sad documentary. It's got a lot of beautiful footage and it's about the life of an artist, an actor, and as Val tells it, there's a lot of beautiful footage because he is the first person he said he knew that had a video recorder. And he has thousands of hours and tapes that he kept. And he has home movies that he did. He has like audition tapes. He also has, he would film on every set that he was ever on. So like one of the first scenes is him um, on the Top Gun set with like his uh, like Wolfman and like they're just like having fun dancing. Tim Robbins. And yeah, it's a really cute scene. Um, yeah, there's even like uh, Tom Cruise dancing in one scene. Like it's it's fun to see all the stars like that young, for sure. And then the, the other great scene was him doing that play with um, Sean Penn and Kevin Bacon. That, that was, was fantastic. Yeah, he said he had the lead in a play until... Sean Penn became available and then Kevin Bacon became available. So he became like the third lead, but it was cute to see all of them. That was good. And I think I'm, I'm not sure, but I think one of the actors in that was Brian Benway or Ben, 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 Brian, Ben, Ben. Does that name ring a bell? Mm -mm. He he was on that TV show, turn on or turn it on uh, uh, about a guy who kind of like me, you know, he'd, he'd be living his life. And then all of a sudden something would remind him of a movie. and and it would show a clip of a movie that it reminded him of. It was a cute show from maybe the eighties or nineties. I th- I think he was one of the actors in that play. I'm not I'm not totally probably. Sure. I'm not sure if all those actors went to Juilliard or or not. But yeah. it seems to be that everyone comes from Juilliard. That's really big. Yeah. So it was cool, and it was cool that that um, I think Kevin Bacon was like, "Whoa, is that a video camera?" You know, mm-hmm. when he showed up. Yeah, he was like, that's really cool, Val. <laughs> and that was awesome. And that was cool. And the, I didn't realize he's a Californian. He grew up not too far from us. Right. And I think that's what makes it so sad is he talks about um, his brother who wanted to be a filmmaker and they would uh, create all these films growing up. And then he died of epilepsy. He drowned in a pool um, right. at 15. And that that just made me sad throughout it. That was horrible. Yeah. And, and, and he, he then talks about how his father who raised them was lax about giving his brother, his epilepsy medicine, his seizure medicines. Um, And he blamed himself for his death for the rest of his life. And he was never the same. So it's so sad. It was very sad. And, and then uh, it was very sad. And then he developed head and neck cancer, you know, so, so watching him now and, and hearing him talk, is knowing what he was, you know, this sex symbol and, and, and with such swagger, you know, and Mm -hmm. um, it's great that he's, that he's still going. And I, and I love the fact that supposedly he's going to be in the next Top Gun, you know, that remake, which I, which I was wondering about that. And if he had, and if you could kind of explain that. So he, he had head and throat cancer. Head Head and neck cancer. It's kind of lumped together. Uh, cancers of of the oral pharynx, you know, the mouth, the inside of the mouth, the throat, 
um, it's kind of considered like throat cancer. So any any kind of mucosa, any any inside the mouth, the tongue, the the throat, um, the top of the esophagus, um, it is kind of lumped together into head and neck cancer. And if it's caught early, it could often be treated just with sometimes local therapy, just excising it, maybe radiating it. Um, but if it's the problem with it, a lot of times is the location of where it is. You need to get it out and you need to get it out with enough of a margin, with enough normal stuff around it. And there are really important things around the head and the neck. And the problem is, is sometimes the treatment is super debilitating where you wind up not being able to, they actually sometimes have to, it could even, you could even get the cancer on your vocal cords or in and around your vocal cords. And in order to get that cancer out, you need to remove that part or radiate that part of you of you in order to get it out and keep it out and because of that if you, they're removing part of your windpipe the upper part you're not going to be able to breathe unless they put a hole in the lower part of the windpipe where you could breathe because they the cancer's here they got to remove that and it's not like you could just put a pipe in and connect it we we don't yet really have the ability to do piping for the windpipe like that sometimes a little bit but but not really um so unfortunately his only way he could breathe is with this tracheostomy this hole coming out probably lower down from where that cancer was that's because so it was talking about how he's doing like the mark twain play which i really want to go to i regret not going to it i forget what it, he did it in la um Oh. oh, you didn't get to that part. Oh, that must like be one of the last things he did before he had to go in for surgery. I guess like he felt like something was wrong with his vocal cords. And I, I don't know, maybe that's when it was too late that he, you know, then he ended up in the hospital for like months. Right. But but he's still alive and he did claim that he's cured. So, you know, it, it was too late in terms of saving his voice and every, and and all of that. But Hopefully he's going to be okay. You know, hopefully he he'll he's he's he'll live a while. Okay, so can you explain that to me? So once you get that hole, that's it. He can never get his voice back. No, okay. uh, that's permanent. Unless sometimes they'll do that temporarily if if the area is injured or damaged, then they need to let it heal. But it doesn't seem like that in his case. It seems like they needed to actually remove that or treat that area, or. Or as part of the treatment, it got injured from the radiation or the surgery or who knows that it's just no longer functioning or maybe it collapses because it's weak. You know, it's a tubing. So maybe, you know, it's hard to say exactly what happened. I, I'm not his doctor. I, I don't I didn't treat him. Um, but that's going to be permanent until they could come up with some cool, you know, futuristic thing. Mm -hmm. That was hard to watch because I guess I knew he had. But he was recovering, but I guess I didn't know that that was that was his life with like covering his windpipe to just try to talk. Right. Yeah. No, I've seen. You know, we unfortunately doing this. You know, we see a lot of people like that, and and uh, um, but you could live a whole life like that, and and hopefully he'll live. And it seems like he does have a full life with kids and mm -hmm. and uh, art, which, which is great. And right. so, so hopefully he'll, he'll be able to lead a full life. Yeah. He, he was saying, um, art helped him recover, which I thought was cool. Yeah. Helped him get out of his depression after surgery. And it seems like his kids are great and it seems like he's very close to his kids, but. Yeah. Know. I mean, it's worth it to see like the footage and like him talk about being an actor, obviously being labeled difficult, even though like, you know, just like one rumor in Hollywood can like, you know, stick with you your your whole career right yeah i i did want to see more of the um the island of dr moreau stuff i i i wanted to see more of that that was cool just a scene where marlon brando was asking him to push him in a hammock <laughs> like oh my gosh that was so adorable i was like this old man i wanted to see more of that stuff yeah. It seemed like Brando didn't want to engage him at all, right? Don't, don't you get the sense? Well, I mean, that's why, I, unfortunately, a lot of information I have to get um, for this podcast, like I end up reading Wikipedia pages, but I'm always like cautious about that because you never know like how true that is. But right. on Wikipedia, it says they, they had a, a, you know, a bad relationship on that set. But the only thing he shows is just like a cute little 
five second documentary. I mean, obviously it's his documentary, so he's choosing what to show, but I don't, I don't really think it's about that. It's just, it's his life as an artist. Like, yeah. That's all he wanted to show, which I respect. Right. I totally do too. Uh, and I thought it was, it was, it was really good. It was just really sad. It really, yeah, it was beautiful, but um, I was a little bit mad. I was like, dang it, Dr. Cullen. I'm like crying. Well, I, I texted you as I was watching it. I think we were watching it and that's, I was like, you know, this is, this is something. Yeah. And I've loved him since forever. My dad um, rented Tombstone one day and I watched it with him and that's his scenes. That's, that's some of the best acting I've ever seen still in my life. Well, I, I love them from real genius. Remember real genius. That's great too. I didn't see that till later when my husband, that's like one of his favorite movies. He showed it to me. Do, do you think it holds up? Cause I'd love for my kids to watch it. I mean, it's really dated, but that was another beautiful thing in that movie is that. So his brother's artwork, he put up in his room in that right. for that movie. So it said, you know, his artwork. And I was like, Oh, it's so sad, but yeah. beautiful. Yeah, that was really cool. The one interesting thing about Val Kilmer is his signature move. You know what his signature move is? The handstand thing that he does in there? What is it? No, no. I'm just thinking it's, of the clip. It's his twirling of a coin. Or oh, a yeah. He, he does it in at least two or three of his movies. He does it in Top Gun when they're sitting in the class at the very beginning when they're at Top Gun. Mm -hmm. And then in Real Genius, he does it with a court with a coin twirling it on his on his fingers that's his signature val kilmer move oh i didn't think of that i was just thinking of a real is it yeah it's real genius right Not real genius weird. yeah 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 real genius yeah yeah and then you're thinking of weird science i know i want to call it weird science i know that's a different yeah. movie. no real genius and then the other movie i really at least remember liking a lot but have no clue is willow oh yeah that was a, a yeah we watched that and then, of course, which we re I recently watched it with my kids because somehow they've gotten into the, the into them. We watched The Doors recently. That's great. Yeah. Which he was a genius in. I mean, that he was just fantastic in The Doors. Yeah. Him. Yeah. Uh, I don't even think he was. I don't know if he's ever even been nominated for an Oscar, which is crazy. I don't know. But nobody knows. Yeah. I think of him as a, a great one of the greatest actors. So, yeah. Yeah. It was great. It's sad to see his career end like that at 61, but I guess like you're saying, maybe it's not done. Maybe he's going to keep writing. Yeah. And making art. Top Gun, some, doing something. Honestly. But making art. He can make great art. Yeah, true. He definitely is an artist. So that's a watch. So anything else you've been watching? Anything else you want to end the... I think there's a lot of stuff, but I think I think this was... We, we had a huge discussion. I, I almost think there's so much going on in the world lately. We maybe should start doing these twice a week. <laughs> yeah. But I just want to end with um, saying Dr. Gordon emailed me because he heard me talking about White Lotus and I was trying to convince you to watch it, but I don't think I did a very good job. He said his son explains it as um, Hitchcock in Hawaii. Does that make you want to watch it? I thought that was really good. No, you know what? My daughter, we, it, it, we sell it. It's my wife's birthday today. The master injector, Bernice, happy birthday. I love you. Um, today is her birthday. Uh, so we went out to dinner last night and my eldest daughter said, oh, you guys got to watch it. So unfortunately or fortunately, I only really get to watch things unless it's a rare occasion right. when I'm with my wife. So now that my wife has heard White Lotus, now I think we'll be able to uh, I'll be able to watch it. Yeah. So it, it's right. on so let list. me know what you think. Yeah, because we just finished that. So it's pretty good. Cool. I think we also need to um, have an episode where we talk about. um Dr. Death. I think that yes. should be. Yes. Should I be haven't watched episode. it yet, but I figured we'd talk about that on a separate episode. Okay, good. So that should be uh, an upcoming. Everybody stay tuned. Dr. Death should be uh, something we're going to talk about soon. I've only watched three quarters of the pilot, but uh, we'll watch a few episodes at least. Yeah. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening to Gross Anatomy and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can check out more episodes on the evolving sights, smells, and sounds of medicine. Gross Anatomy is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider 